the hardest decision I've made in life, I'd say. But, you know, one that I thought I handled well. Guys that come in, they feel what we felt last year. They buy into it, they subscribe to it because it was genuine. I would hate to see free kicks like that decide a final or a big game because, to me, that's not AFL football. To go through a whole season without a pre-season is bloody hard work, so I need to get the work in. I went into hospital just thinking I was going to get some antibiotics and ten minutes later I was under the knife. It all got done in two-hour parking, though. So was... <laughs> Your ticket into the heart of football. Welcome to the Breakfast Club's Inner Sanctum. Welcome one, and welcome all to the Inner Sanctum, and great to have Max Gorn with us from the D's, who I find out today, according to Champion Data, is the number one player in the game in the first seven rounds. You're sitting there nodding as if that's just the way it should be. Max, good morning. Morning, guys. Those stats might be slightly skewed to Ruckman, I think. Are they? Potentially. Um, super coach points. Too many yeah. super coach points for hit outs. <laughs> hit outs. Too many yeah. hit outs. Well, the, no one else gets to contest a hit out, so um, there's only two people on the ground that can get that stat. <laughs> Um, a, but I'll take it. The I'll third, take it. The third man up, or no third man up, yeah. will help the super coach for Ruckman, hasn't it? Yeah, I'd say so. Um, I actually didn't mind the third man up rule, but it definitely has helped. Um, it has helped Ruckman in terms of hit yeah, numbers. I'd be right, I'd be strutting in hard today to the footy club if I was num- the number one player in the in the game. Yeah, we started at six thirty. I'm just going to walk in at <laughs> walk in at eight after 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 I finish here. It's amazing how, in all seriousness, it's amazing how quickly things change. You know, you came in here what, four or five weeks ago, and we're talking about how you were being targeted by opposition and all this sort of thing. And the next thing, you read the paper, and you're the number one ranked player in the competition again. Do you it goes I've, up and down like a yo-yo. Do you reckon I've worked my way through being targeted, or they've stopped targeting me? I reckon they're uh, a bit a bit soft on you. You reckon, you reckon I should go harder? Right. Have, have, you been, have you been targeted since that game? Just the Port Adelaide game got pumped up more than anything I've ever seen. Like yeah. there was, it just got caught on camera. That happens every week. Um, Hawthorne are actually really good at protecting McAvoy, and um, I was able to fight through that. But look, I, the Port Adelaide game was a poor game, but I've been sort of working my way back into form since then. Did it sting you that game when you look back on it now? The criticism. Or did, is it something that you don't even bother? Because I know you do like to read the papers and sort of absorb the media. I mean, you sort of addressed it at the time, but so sort of six weeks later, did it sting you? Did it annoy you? Not really. It's amazing how much a bad game is career over with a lot of people. Um, no, nah, it, it didn't really affect me, to be honest. And I was that excited to go out and play in Geelong because I love playing down at Skilled Stadium or whatever it's called. Um, <laughs> GMHBO. GMHBO, GMHBO is changed. that what it is? Um, and I, yeah, so I was really looking forward to getting down there and, and to, I knew in my own head that I wasn't that bad. Yeah. Um, I, I, who, who was it? It was Lice Adam Ryder. Um, I still felt like I competed hard against them and all three of us almost didn't have an impact on that day. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and I've worked my way slowly back into form. It's taken a while, but, um, I'm only as good as the three midfielders that I have with me and they were all good on the weekend as well. They were good on the weekend, as were you, it must be said. Um, what's it like on the Monday coming in? When one and five, like your season is literally on the line um, and you, and you get, up, get home in a real nail biter. Those last couple of minutes for you, what were they like? We, used, we spoke to Nathan Jones about this was it yesterday um, and he was talking about the stress in the last couple of minutes, but his experience sort of got him through. What was it like for you in the last couple of minutes? Uh, were you thinking about the result? See, I was probably quite opposite to Nathan. I was quite calm. Um, I did lace out Sean Bergerwin and get them within a point of us. So <laughs> I'll, if there was someone to be stressed, it probably should have been me. But um, No, look, I was quite calm the whole game, and it was almost the way we set up the game um, throughout the week. It felt like we were 0-0 zero zero in a way. Um, we weren't. We are 1-5. And, um, and that had me with a calm head towards the end of the game because mm. um, we felt like we were in control during the third quarter. We also had a bit of confidence in the way the team was playing, so they kicked those three early goals and no one dropped their head and we were able to keep fighting and uh, lucky Marty Hall got a spoil on wing guard at the end there. Well, that, yeah, nice little fingertip there. That was good. Uh, that, that, that was the point I was going to ask next about the three goals in a row because that could have been easily... Um, you could have easily folded on the back of that. Like you've worked so hard to get in a position to win. They come back and they kick a couple of goals, rough head and, and Bruce, I think it was late in the... or so midway through that last term. It would have been easy to say, oh, bloody hell, it's all too hard. We just, it's not quite our time. But you kept going. I mean, you must be really proud of the effort of the boys to do that. Yeah, and I think the third one was a, was a 50-metre penalty um, with Gunston. And Harmsy gave away his 15 for the day. <laughs> um, and resulted in a goal. And like, that's the one that can really crush your conf- 
confidence because it's um, come from um, what you think is not really a free kick or something like that. So, um, yeah, look, we had a lot of time and we knew that. We got together as a midfield um, and I'm sure the backs and forwards did. I haven't gone through any sort of vision, but we usually do. And they would have talked through a plan for the next 15 minutes or so. Um, We just narrowed it right down to the next centre bounce. Um, if we can get it in our forward half, because we were still in front, so yeah. if we can get it in our forward half, um, it'll be an easy game for us, and that's what happened. It was pretty impressive. Uh, and the celebrations in the rooms, what was the mood like in the rooms? Because you said before, and I've heard somebody else say, that you went into the game as sort of 0-0, trying to have that mentality. Was it a 0-0 uh, or 1-0 vibe in the rooms post-game? Yeah, so we're 1-0. That's, yeah. that's good. Um, <laughs> You're in front of the legend. <laughs> yeah. We're in the top eight. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> No, it was it was just we got the job done. Um, it was actually it was relatively good to see everyone um, not over celebrating, but enjoying the win and already focused on making sure that isn't just one out of the hat. So mm. um, Melbourne has been criticised in the past of really over celebrating some wins, and I mean it's because where we've come from, we love winning now, and um, we're not going to take winning for granted because we've been on the other end where we don't win. But a win like that, where we've been one and five, you've got to enjoy it. Um, but it's exciting to hopefully win a few more. Why are you laughing, Brendan? Over celebrating wins. Why are you laughing? Because he was the one who beat us by 160 at the G. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't. Too. I'm glad you were thinking about that, not me. <laughs> how, how are you generally post-game? Is, uh, I always felt that post-game was like kind of the, the best time of the week. Cause yeah. You, well, one, because you win, but two, you know that you've got another at least six days to... Uh, kind of enjoy the win before you have to do it all again that first hour was really good um you get through recovery a lot easier than what you normally do the ice baths aren't actually that cold when (laughs) when when it wins um yeah and even when you go home that night it's just easier to sleep easier to sleep much more relaxing you actually want to wake up on sunday morning um (laughs) so there's a few things that do um just set yourself up for a better week when you win and it becomes easier earlier in the week um, but there's still lots of elements of the game where we played quite poor, so um, we got brought back to Earth on Monday, don't worry. <laughs> it, it felt like um, it was a bit more Melbourne-like in the way you played. I, I don't think there's any doubt that you've still got a bit of improving to go. Did When did it start to feel different to you out on the field playing it, that this wasn't the Melbourne of the last three or four weeks, this was a bit different? Uh, I looked at body language early, um, even when we were a couple of goals down real early in the game we were losing contested ball which is I mean they're two things that we didn't want to be down on uh, down by um, but I looked at the body language and it was all really positive and um, everyone was talking um, there's a great clip of Clad Oliver putting his arm around Christian Petraka at half at half time there's, there's guys thinking about their teammates rather than themselves and um, not saying that was the main problem over the first six weeks but that's something that we've been addressing and um, to see that in the first quarter gave me confidence that we are going to kick a score at some point. Um, we had to wait till the third quarter to actually put that on the scoreboard, but um, it was positive signs quite early in the game. Has Simon Goodwin done anything differently? We've talked over the last couple of weeks about how even just his commentary in the media has been fractionally different. Um, what's it been like internally to try and find this, this spark to, to get your season back on track? Um, oh... I mean, it's a great question. I don't think we just got given some sprinkle dust from the from Coles and was able to was able to play better. Um, there is a, a lot of things coaches do to say that one was the one thing that got us back into a winning team um, would be a big call. But uh, look, the ten days off really helped um, to refresh. Well, it was four days off from the club, but ten days in between games and. Um, that four days off really refreshed us and the first day back we were down at Casey which we haven't been at for a while and um, it was just a great vibe down there um, being able to train not on the busiest in, uh, in, intersection in Melbourne being just in your own <laughs> little pocket was was quite handy so um, there was a few things that happened probably throughout that week and um, it led us but even going into the Richmond game we changed a few things up as well even though there was only three days in between games but um, so it's been a relatively positive place to be the last sort of two weeks. 
The role of James Harms. Oh, I'm intrigued by how he's been used in the start of this season, considering how well he performed last season, particularly as that sort of run, run with, um, but also like Cameron Ling, he used to get a lot of the ball himself. His role on Jago Mira after quarter time was phenomenal, or probably wins you the game um, in, in a short summary. Is it something we'll see more of him back in that role again, do you think? Because he's been a bit more attacking uh, as opposed to negating playing off, it seems, just watching from afar. Is that a fair assessment of what's happened with James in his role? Um, yeah, that's relatively fair. There's been a few times where he's been chucked on a player and it hasn't worked. Um, he probably hates me saying that, but there is. Uh, we've tried it a few times this year to get it back to where he was um, at the end of last year. And, yep. Um, Either it hasn't worked out or he's put in a really good effort, but the player's still got numbers, and um, so it hasn't really been seen. But internally, he's highly rated as one of our better defensive mid- midfielders. And um, when Jaeger was on fire, there was no second question if it was going to be Jonesy or Clayton or Angus or was Harmsy straight away. And, yeah. Um, he did the job, and I mean, he gets the ball himself, which is a great quality to have as someone who's um, so defensively minded in the, in the middle, and he kicked the winning goal as well, which is. Um, something taggers don't tend to do. So um, he probably doesn't call himself a tagger, and we don't as well. He's he, he's someone who who just plays on. A, um, well, this is probably slamming the rest of the midfielders, but someone who actually plays on a man and um, and oh, then it's team defence, yeah, <laughs> and then works in the other way. The so. most accountable midfielder. <laughs> I yes. love when a midfielder says they get tagged. I said, well, every other player gets uh-huh. gets played on. So. Um, Rui really used to say this. <laughs> I'm a forward. I get tagged every week. You, you bloody sook. So just deal with it. Um, fair point. Yeah, but that really close attention is something to hard, is hard to deal with, and Harms is really good at that. Now, I'm going to give you some stats. Oh, I do love a stat. This stat is, man. This is really good stuff. I'll be uh, judge of that. So, no, it is. <laughs> you'll, you'll be impressed by this. Right, Jago Mira, yes. to quarter time, had oh, 11 yes. disposals and a goal. Yes. At quarter time, James Harms went to him. After quarter time, Jago Mira, eight disposals. James, that's for the rest of the game. Mm-hmm. James Harms, 27 disposals. Contested possessions after quarter time. O'Meara, four. James Harms, 14. Mm-hmm. Metres gained after quarter time. O'Meara, 35. James Harms, 436. Inside 50s after quarter time. O'Meara, one. <laughs> I think we get James the, Harms, eight. I think we get the point. It's going to be difficult for him to get too <coughs> Take much. Take that for data. <laughs> That's right. That's well, compelling stats. Well, I don't think we can argue that uh, James had the better of mm. Jago in that occasion. He's mm. very, very good. Well, yeah. I think he won the game from. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. He had a really good weekend, James, and he also had a great video with the fan as well, Jono. Um, ah, yes. It just shows the kind of person he is, and he gets the best out of his footy, and um, he's a wonderful person as well. Nice to hear. 20 past seven, you're a wonderful man yourself. Stay with us, Max. Uh, the Inner Sanctum guest from the Demons, Big Max Gorn, with us today. We'll take a break, come back, and talk some more on The Breakfast Club. Exclusive access behind closed doors. The Breakfast Club's Inner Sanctum. We look at a lot of different measures and, and Louis has been executing his role to the level that we'd expect. I find it you know, difficult to swallow um, that, that people would even question that, particularly you know, with his standing in the game. 23 past 7 on The Breakfast Club. You're in the inner sanctum of the Melbourne Football Club. Max Gorn, the number one player in the competition, according to Champion Data, is our man. And that was Nathan Jones, co-captain of the Dues, supporting Jordan Lewis, who's come under some criticism and some fire for his form of recent weeks. Louis, affected by that, Max? Difficult to swallow is a big term, isn't it, from Jonesy? (laughs) Makes it sound like a lot worse than it is. Um, No, it's not affecting Jordan. Um, it's It's a bit weird, the commentary... Um, I understand majority of people get it um, late in their careers and um, Louis is copping it now, but um, he's not getting 33 playing in the midfield, but he's doing his role at halfback and that's all we ask from him. He's turned over a couple by foot, which he admits is not up to his standards, but he's contested ball and he still defends his man. He's, um, he's getting his role done, so we're pretty happy with him in there at the moment. You ju- Sorry, you go. You it's go. just amazing how they change from one week to the other. A couple of weeks ago, as he's... Well, of course, the first thing everyone talks about is speed, and he can't defend now. And then, so then he misses a few kicks, and now now he, oh, he can't kick. His decision making is now like it's extraordinary. It's just it's it's laughable. I'm a bit biased, but I think Jordan's probably one of the best field kicks in the competition. 
Well, so knows. so he makes a couple of mistakes, so all of a sudden he's, he can't kick anymore. Well, that's what I'm saying. I don't subscribe to that theory. Yeah, yeah, no, but, no, it's but, just... it, but it's like it's like all the the champion players they get judged on the bar of when they're at their absolute best, as opposed to what they can still contribute to the team or what they... they're still doing well. Yeah, that's right. Everyone wants that's... to focus on. I'm not saying it's right, but that's what happens. I don't think it's just Jordan. I think it's all of them fall into that category. Yeah, I think there's a lot of stats looking. With, when it comes to Jordan, there is some times when you can put up a clip of him actually missing the kick, but it, he has got less stats than what he normally has, and he's but he's played a different role. So is he? What I was going to ask you is he judged more on what he does on the field, or judged more on what he does off the field in regards to leadership and coaching and these sorts of things? Because essentially, that's why he was brought to the football club. Uh, first and foremost, he's a player, so. He's got to get his on-field job done, and um, we're we've we're. I'm not sure if this happened in the past with the Melbourne Football Club, but there's definitely no gifting games or um, getting a game just because you're a good leader. Um, you need to be able to play your on-field role, and that's why he's getting the game. So um, he does bring it oozes in leadership, and um, has been everywhere in his 320 odd games. But um, first and foremost, you want your role being ticked off, and he's ticking it off. Fair enough. Hey, yeah, that was, by the way, the score in the Man City Leicester game, 1-0 to Man City. They have a one-point lead at the top of the table with one game remaining. City have got Brighton away and Liverpool have Wolves at home um, for the final game of the EPL season. Before we get to um, Stephen May, who requires some conversation, the comments from Alistair Clarkson post-match, did you hear those? That he, Basically, he said, I'm paraphrasing, Melbourne are less, were less crap than we were today. Not really pumping up either team. Hawthorne, middle of the road, said Melbourne need to be a lot better to to achieve anything this year as well. Were you surprised to hear that from Clarko? Have you, have you, has it been discussed within the club? Uh, has it been discussed? I've done a little bit of media since and I've been asked that question a lot. Um, I'm presuming he just got asked a question and he answered it. Um, he might, I'm not sure of the question, but it might have had Melbourne in the, in the, in the actual question and he's answered the question um, like that and that's where the grabs come from. But... Um, I'm not going to speak about Hawthorne. Um, I'm only going to speak about our club. And when you going on the semi-final last year, we won in the real messy game. Yep. Um, so we knew it was going to be a messy game, and that's what it turned out to be. It might not have been great to watch, but I generally don't know if it's a bad game to watch until I read the papers the next day. Um, it felt like a good game to play, and felt pretty heated, quite scrappy, and. Um, we got we we won like a one and five side is not going to be is not going to worry about winning winning in a bad looking game. Doesn't matter how you win, you just need to win. Correct. Yep. Interesting. Well, let's go, Stephen May, because he's um, in headlines last night. Story broken on Fox Sports that uh, he will be fronting the players and uh, apologising for a Sunday sesh type activity with some mates um, whilst being in rehab. When did you, were you first alerted to this information, Max? Um, uh, you're. Ex- I, I, I get that I come in because I don't give cliches a lot, like, but um, the old I don't know anything actually works here. Um, <laughs> I actually was, just before I was going to watch the final episode of Sex Education on Netflix, which is a great series if anyone's watched it, um, On the Couch was on. I'm coming back to that, by the way. <laughs> <we'll> continue. <laughs> on the Couch was on the TV, and I managed to see Tom Morris with his latest scoop on Stephen May, and that's the first I heard about it, so... Um, well, I haven't been rushed in for a 6am leadership group this morning, so we haven't talked about it, and I think it's fair enough to let Stephen or the club talk about it first before I release a scoop on RSN. Happy Which, with that? I'm, I'm happy, more than happy with that. That's what you know, that's what you know. That's no dramas. We were talking before, um, well, really this morning, about the role of leadership groups and all this sort of stuff, and, and how the conversation happens. This is obviously the example at the moment for Melbourne, but in, on a, in a broader sense, when you have someone who has transgressed to whatever level and degree and requires a conversation, what is the role of the leadership group? How does that conversation go? Um, Forget Stephen for a second. Yeah, well, we, we will definitely talk about it. Um, not everything is a black and white decision, so there's going to be elements to every story that you've got to process, and I'm presuming this will be one. One, we, we do have a no drinking in rehab rule, so that is a rule. I don't know what's happened. I don't know any details, but take Stephen out of it. On another case, there is a no drinking in rehab rule. Oh, he's in trouble. So that'll be talked about, but Stephen is is on a long-term injury list. Um, he's, does, it, does that change? Well, he's more than six or seven weeks away. Um, he's not actually running at the moment, so there's elements that you can look at. 
Um, yeah, so in terms of the drinking policy, because I know that, that Essendon in the past, long-term injuries are different to a, a two, three-week injury and what type of injury it is. So well, they are, change the... they, are, they are different, but it needs to be talked about. Yep. Um, so if I had a broken arm, that's something different to a hamstring. Um, there is elements to that, but without getting permission to do it, it's a blanket rule, if you know what I mean. Um, mm. So that that of any 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 case will get discussed, and there's not the same punishment for the same people. Is there a punishment at all? Um, is there more stuff going on in his life? Um, they're all elements that we'll talk about, and um, unfortunately, it's just really early in this situation with Stephen. So just a general comment about Stephen. He's obviously new to the club, and he hasn't had the best of starts. Let's be honest. Have you questioned his commitment to football? Because that was what was raised last night, that it's not his number one priority, and, and, and Paul Ruse was fairly categoric about that. What's your impressions of Stephen since he's come to the club? You have to be quite categoric on a Monday night to get your voice heard on the Tuesday morning because there's a lot of people that talk on a Monday night, and ruse has gone with the biggest comment, and that's the one that's landed today. So, um, no, well, I carries weight because of his involvement with Correct, involvement. correct. Yeah. He doesn't know Stephen, though. Yeah, correct. Um, True. Uh, Stephen has trained his uh, backside off. Um, I've been really impressed with how he's how he's trained. Um, bit unfortunate in the second JLT game, hurt his groin and his quads and that sort of part of his body. And he's um, been in rehab e- ever since, and he's still bringing a lot to the game because he's played over a hundred games and captain a captain a football club. So um, he's definitely an ear that I've been leaning on and. Um, I'm sure when he gets back, he'll be playing some pretty good footy because he set himself up with a really good preseason. Did he, you have? Yes, yeah, so, no. I was just going to say he's a, he's a unique story because, as you said, he was captain. I mean, there was a lot of focus on Tom Lynch because uh, because of how good a player he is. But they were co-captains, and Melbourne gave up a lot to get him. So can you can understand the not the frustration, but the well, it is probably frustration that he hasn't been out there playing because he is such a big recruit and probably really important to your future. Yeah, but this is there's frustration, but that's frustration because he's a wonderful player. We want him playing, but not because he has done bad by the team, and we're annoyed that someone that we've given up so much for is not playing because of his own fault. Um, he he put in a really good preseason. Um, I don't care all the talk about his preseason. He put in a really good preseason, and coming into JLT two, unfortunately, he got injured and he's been out ever since and. Um, it's disappointing, but that happens with a lot of people. And I'm sure if he's back in round 10 and round 15, he's played five good games. There'll be no talk about this at all. So um, it's a difficult time for him. It's a difficult time for the club, but hopefully he can get back and be playing some good footy soon. One of your other big recruits, Jake Lever, um, has announced that he'll be back around about the Adelaide game mid-season. It's he, promising. He announced that, didn't he? Oh, oh somebody <laughs> did. I think it was him. I've, um, I've been through the knee Rico stuff as well, and you see the surgeon around nine months and the surgeon wanted you playing at six months usually the surgeons are quite confident that their job is good um, and they also don't mind you coming back in because it's more money for them so um, it's a win-win for the surgeon they either look really good or they get another job um, so he he's training really well he's trained with us the last sort of two or three weeks so um, I'm not sure how much of a pre-season they want to put into him but I'm presuming that's the only thing that's holding him back now that's good news. Very good news for Melbourne fans. We, sh- we should ask about Jack Viney as well because y- you need him back as quickly as possible. It w- could it be as early as this week? Uh, yeah, he, um, we did win without him. Um, yeah, that's true. So, yeah, we'd love him back, but th- need him as much as possible. Um, I'm happy for him to get his shoulder as good as possible so we don't keep missing him for random weeks at times. Um, but, yes, he is one of our better players and he's the captain of the football club and leads by example. So be good to have him out there, but um, Jack's problem in the last two or three years has been rushing his injuries and um, potentially playing through pain and causing some problems for him. So um, we all know that he just needs to get his shoulder right first before he puts his hand up. You made some unusual decisions in your life. One of those was trying to eat an omelette on the run this morning. The other one <laughs> is um, this sex education series on Netflix. Explain to me what, what's going on there. Uh, oh, it's just a, a show about a kid whose mum is a sex therapist. and um, I wouldn't recommend it if your sex life isn't intact. But um... uh, Is it real life? <laughs> is it a doco style or is it a series? No, no, series. series. It's got a bit of a home and away feel about it rather than a doco feel about it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> no, but it's good. It's good. Netflix has come up for special there. <laughs> right, I'll um, I'll give it a look. I'll, see, I'll report back. <laughs> Can I ask one more question? How's um, how's how's Goody been through uh, this first seven weeks? Um, Yeah, he tells a lot about a coach um, who can be one and five and still come in with a positive attitude. And um, yeah, he's he's gone tough on a few people, and those people have needed it. And um, he's gone tough on the group at times, but he's also been there for support. And um, he's. He's a really smart coach and he understands the game. So um, we have a lot of faith in him that he'll get it right and we'll get it right. And um, it seems to have worked on the weekend. But once again, we've got to keep backing it up. But he's just had a he's had a really good six or seven weeks. And, and sorry, last one. And then how's my other mate Craig Jennings going in his uh, opposition? Yeah, he's good. Um, he, uh, there's a, it's funny. Jenno thinks he's going to be the next senior coach somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> He, uh, his opposition stuff's very funny and, I mean, uh, very informative and he's very smart, isn't he? He's just a weird, 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 weird man. Weird yeah. smart or good, like, yeah. He understands the game. Yeah. Um, Lateral very, thinker. Yeah. Lateral thinker, that's exactly what he is. But he, um, he's a very handy person to have, especially you appreciate us coach. talking about him on radio this morning too. And he presses good press for Jenna. <laughs> a bit of the head wobbles. Well, we'll get him next to the goody in the box on uh, Saturday at Metricon Stadium. Make sure he gets some real prime time coverage. That's what we're after. Go and enjoy the sunshine, Max. We're well, nice to chat. We'll look forward to another Demons victory on the weekend. Thanks, boys. Max Gorn, the best player in the competition, according to the champion data. He's our man on the Inner Sanctum from the D's on the Breakfast Club. 24 to 8. Scotty Gallon will join us after this.